And welcome back. Thank you for keeping it. Punchline, Honorable Mili Mabona Odiambo. The original Lako there, did you say yes. so? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I can't say I'm the original Lako there. In the public, that is the Lako there. That's the Lako there. But Lako there is my um, family name, childhood name. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, yeah. uh, let's return just to some quick politics and, and talk about the constitution thereafter. Uh, what are your thoughts on the political future of your party leader, Raila Odinga? Should he run for the presidency? Of course. Why not? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Raila is uh, one of the most intriguing characters. Uh, he gets younger instead of getting older. <laughs> he gets more vibrant. Uh -huh. And his ideas are ever fresh, so why not? Okay. I don't see any problem. Okay. But that really depends on him. But mm -hmm. for me, I don't see any problem. Okay. And, yeah. um, you know, he's been engaged in uh, a war of words with the deputy president um, over the handshake, a handshake which was supposed to bring everybody together, bring peace, bring um, cohesion. Has the handshake in that sense failed if it seemed to be only... A replacement of alliances rather than rallying the entire country. Well, together. the handshake is not actually a replacement of alliances. It appears because, to be. Because if I have a handshake with you, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean I am kicking the other. If somebody else feels uncomfortable with the handshake, mm. it really can't be uh, a factor of the handshake. It's actually a factor of the other person. It has nothing to do with the handshake. But your party leader and has said that a tsunami is coming that is going to sweep, uh, uh, he calls them Taka Taka MPs. These are MPs who are obviously allied to the deputy president into, you know, oblivion. Well, that may be, the poli that may be politics because he says tsunami mm. will be coming. Mm. He's not saying the tsunami is here. here. <laughs> the handshake is here. Mm -hmm. So if he's talking about tsunami, that's a different level mm. when politics comes. Now he's not playing politics because handshake is about a retreat. It's about working together. It's about not fighting. So then when he talks about a tsunami that's coming, that's it, the future. And the politics will come in the future. And yet the fighting is still it. happening. Hence well, my if question, you notice, is it really a success? If you, if you notice, I think... I think the handshake was more for Kenyans than for the political class. Mm. So if you ask for majority of Kenyans who didn't want um, uh, people running on the streets every day, you know, demonstrating, mm. who didn't want the kind of level of hate that was going in the country on an ethnic basis, who didn't want trade, uh, you know, to be as difficult as it was, then they can tell you that the handshake is working. Who didn't want the political intrigues that we are having in the house mm. that every time one side stands, we just oppose because we don't like you? Mm. That, uh, if that's what we are talking about, then the handshake has succeeded. James Orengo was on the program and uh, he said that there exists a kind of, um, not written in stone, but there exists a timeline for the handshake to deliver on very specific things before the ODM or NASA supporters get restless. What do you believe it must deliver on, and is that having Raila Odinga substantially in power? Well, I think those, that is the view of Honorable Rengo. Mm -hmm. For me, as Honorable Mili, mm -hmm. I know that when we are talking about the handshake, and the handshake is about you know bringing peace, uh, bringing uh, you know people together, bringing cohesion, and moving the country forward. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, there going to be a timeline, I don't think the timeline is cast in stone. It's just as a matter of course that when the, you know, uh, the period for campaigns comes, then people will take positions. So if you are talking about timelines in that sense, mm -hmm. then it will come. Okay. Yeah, but right now for me, yeah, and then, you know, there may be trigger actions that you can never, you know, talk about in politics, mm -hmm. and anything can be a trigger action that would then either enhance or bring a challenge to, you know, okay. uh, to the, the handshake. handshake. All right. And sometimes it's some, uh, the most unforeseen thing that can enhance the handshake or that can weaken the handshake. Okay. So those ones are normal in politics. All right. Yeah. Uh, constitution, do you support the Klamath to amend the constitution? And, and if so, what specifically ought to be changed? Well, I support the uh, a push for the constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. I am often consistent about certain issues. Mm -hmm. And one of them which I was consistent uh, on in the last uh, constitutional amendment is ensuring one third gender representation. Mm -hmm. So yes, I would wish to see a constitutional amendment that would entrench that. I would wish to see a constitutional amendment that would see a return 
of a parliamentary system because it's the most effective system. Excuse, I was in the 10th parliament, I've been in the 11th parliament, and now I'm on the 12th parliament. And I can tell you the most effective system of representation is what we had in the 10th parliament. When you have an issue concerning your constituency, mm -hmm. you have your cabinet secretaries in the house, they answer you on the spot, they deal with your issues on the spot. The system that we have right now, if you have an issue, you go and queue uh, outside the uh, CSS office when you are supposed to be legislating or representing your constituents. And sometimes you go and lie in a queue there for uh, two weeks and with no response. So, sometimes, so for me, because of that, I prefer the parliamentary system where you have issues right on the floor of the house. Yet the world over it is seen as a very unstable system that is leading to constant upheavals of governments, you know, censuring of premiers and, and new votes and new ones coming in and you have, you know, government policy also changing can quite we, can we look at Can we look at the history of Kenya with our presidential system that we always have upheavals and all that, yet the short times that we have had uh, the parliamentary system when we had, it was one of the most effective under that system is when we had the most, uh, you know, development uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of economic growth, it was one of the best periods. So what do I know in relation to Kenya? That it has worked in Kenya. When we had Kibaki and Raila under that system, it worked very well. But wasn't but it when also we the had time when a, a lot of people lamented, you know, grand corruption? Compared to what we have seen in the other parts, where we are talking about trillions of, of corruption, no, I don't think so. Okay. I think the other system surpasses it. All right. Uh, you've, you've also talked about it being uh, specific, for instance, on um, gender. Or perhaps before we get to that, do, do you accept that the executive ought to be expan expanded, I beg your pardon, in order to be, appear more inclusive? Well, I don't know whether it's necessarily, uh, well, you could call it expanded. Mm -hmm. But for me, you know, whenever you talk about... Um, a parliamentary system that necessarily the system will change. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying I'm not talking about uh, expanding, but mm -hmm. dealing with the realities of a parliamentary system. Okay. And uh, that means there are certain so this positions. Whole, uh -huh. President, yeah. deputy president, prime minister, dep two deputy prime ministers, and all that kind of talk. That would you... come with a parliamentary system. Okay. That necessarily comes with a parliamentary system because then you'll have a prime minister, you can have a deputy prime minister, or you could choose a prime minister without all the deputies. But you that don't believe depend. its function is for inclusivity, as most politicians is have claimed. Is inclusivity a crime? I don't I'm think not... so. No, but Part of you... the issues mm -hmm. in this country that have created problems in this country is a lack of inclusivity. So even if it were about inclusivity, what's wrong with that? I don't think so, though for me it's not primarily about inclusivity. Mm -hmm. But even if it were about inclusivity, mm -hmm. what's wrong with that? No, I'm what's just asking, does it, does it solve the problem? For instance, I had Largely Honorable Mr. Scurry on the program, uh, was it last week? And, and he said that he knows very well that it does not mean inclusivity. I, uh, you know, I told him and I posed to you the same thing, that regardless of which community you're elected from, once you hold these positions, you don't hold it as a member of your community, you hold it to serve all Kenyans. And, and his response pretty much was the fact that there are communities in this country who will not feel included unless they see their man or woman at the top and therefore it would still be worthwhile. Do you agree with that? Well, what I can tell you is that even though you'll be representing Kenyan, unfortunately in our country, our politics is very ethnic based. So even though, like even right now, we have a president who is representing all Kenyans, mm -hmm. but who do people see at the helm? They see a kikuyu. Mm -hmm. So let's not pretend about that mm -hmm. because that's how Kenyans see things. We have a deputy president who is representing all Kenyans. But who do Kenyans see? They see a Kalenje. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And because of that, people, and then unfortunately, during the campaigns, there was a debate about you serve for this time, then you leave for me, then I leave for you, you know, that, right. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the Kenyans were saying, okay, so us, you are passing the baton back and forth. Mm -hmm. Where are the rest of Kenyans? If the Kenyans were not thinking ethnically, mm -hmm. then they wouldn't have said we are the rest of Kenyans. So you cannot ignore the ethnic factor in Kenyan politics. Mm -hmm. And therefore, even if you are talking about inclusivity, mm -hmm. inclusivity doesn't necessarily mean that you are creating an executive that will have 40, 
43 people or whatever. There you but are, and that's the challenge. So how do you yes, choose that's what where I'm, the five should come th from? That is what I'm going to tell you, mm -hmm. that if you have a situation in Kenya mm -hmm. where we have uh, a, a significant, not a significant, mm -hmm. but a prominent group or a prominent personalities that have taken the forefront, that represent large groups, for that moment may be seen as representative. Okay. And then you have an inclusive cabinet that mm -hmm. may have the rest of the face of Kenya, mm -hmm. may be seen as representative. And then you have other communities that do not get into that and get into the cabinet, getting into other cough uh, you know, appointments, attorney general, DPP, and other positions. Should that be that, the actual letter of the law? In no, that cannot be the actual letter of the law. Then how do you ensure that But that, that it's should be enforced. in political negotiations. I'm say, well, the one that I'm talking in terms of mm -hmm. the wider, you cannot legislate that then there will be a DPP that is, you know, of this tribe or whatever. But what I'm saying that once you provide, uh, you know, the... Um, uh, what do you call it, mm -hmm. uh, an expanded mm -hmm. uh, executive, if you may, mm -hmm. and you use the constitutional language of an inclusive, uh, inclusive appointment, right. then that should actually take, if you are true, to the letter and spirit of the constitution yeah. that talks about uh, inclusivity based on ethnicity, but, and we and this, the wording is actually ethnicity. And this still doesn't it is happen, in the constitution. Really, which is which is uh, why I'm asking this question because if it's about political goodwill, you know it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. So yes. you have no way of guaranteeing that those are the results you. There's will no way get. of guaranteeing, mm -hmm. but at least let us try. Let us give it a try. Mm -hmm. Instead of just saying because you know as politicians we always have you know bad manners, we don't follow the law. Mm -hmm. But let us have the law. Let us try. To unite Kenyans and you remember this is what was also part of what the handshake was all about mm -hmm. that we don't have to be fighting each other all the time mm -hmm. we can do politics without fighting each other and we can move on as a country without fighting each other let's so move for to... me I think that is a sort of you know the sort of goodwill that should be nurturing going forward Okay, um, uh, let's move to the gender issues um, and, and interrogate, you know, your views regarding constitutional change, regarding um, yes. gender. Um, so you said that that is something you would want to effect, that yes. to ensure that there are not more than two-thirds gender rule is complied yes, with. Yes, that's one thing I would love to see, sort of number one. It? How do we do it? That you can only do if you go through referendum, from based on what we have seen in Parliament. There is no goodwill, especially from our male colleagues. Mm. Uh, they'll string you along, tell you we are going to support you. And on the day of voting, they deny you uh, the two-thirds vote. When, fortunately for me, I was actually in the 10th parliament that uh, pushed the, the constitutional reform, right. and I was in the select committee that came up with the constitution. And we tried our best, but we were not able to get the numbers that we needed. Mm. But we managed to get 47, mm -hmm. and we said we live to fight another day. So this is the other day that we are living to fight. And how do but you we work it only in the referendum? What, what would be the wording to guarantee implementation? Well, the wording would be about numbers. Uh -huh. It wouldn't be about principles. Mm -hmm. You would entrench principles, but you must entrench numbers. And I said it, you remember even when you started the constitution, the pre-2010, mm -hmm. I opposed the constitution. And I opposed the constitution on the basis of a gender rule. And I opposed it because it did not have numbers. Right. It only had principles. principles and right. I remember a lot of women at that point did not, uh, you know, agree with me. They were saying, oh, you know, this constitution is supportive of women. And I remember, what, uh, you know, my very good friend, Honorable Martha Karua, mm -hmm. at one point actually challenged me and said, you can't say you are supporting women when you oppose the constitution that had women representation. And I told Honorable Martha I did not support it because it did not have numbers. When you have principle without numbers, people will not you know, be true to it. And uh, what I said has actually come to pass, mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. Constitution is clear mm -hmm. that we are supposed to give the one-third right. as a principle. Mm -hmm. But because we didn't put the formula because we said we'll provide it later, mm -hmm. the rest of our colleagues have refused. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that let us, in the referendum, provide a formula that actually is clear on numbers okay. so that we come in knowing that we want 120 women or 50 women right. or two women. Okay. Let's be clear on numbers. Uh, and, but having said that Parliament as presently constituted does not comply. 
um, yes. with that principle. And some organizations like the We Are 52% Collective has already petitioned the Chief Justice to dissolve it um, according to Chapter 18, Article 261.7. Do you think it is time for the Chief Justice to advise the President to dissolve Parliament? Well, if you are talking, uh, if you are saying what the Constitution says, if you are speaking to the letter of the law, mm -hmm. then that would be the position that should be done. However, mm. I don't think the court is brave enough. The same court that overturned President Kenyatta's first election is not brave enough. Well, on women they were brave on that, but they are not brave on gender. That is the joke, let me tell you, Anne, that when we were in, the, um, mm. when we were in Naivasha on the constitutional review, mm -hmm. When we went there, if you, do, if you remember, it was after the post-election violence. The country was really at a very bad place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a lot of tension. And when we went, I remember people were equating our meeting to the white smoke uh, for choosing a new uh, pope. When the country is tense, right. it's right. almost like the Eliud moment when every, the country <laughs> was tense waiting for... At 57, you know, right? <laughs> yes, like, are we going to make it right. on seconds? Mm -hmm. And guys were looking for, uh, at the, rest of the select committee and guys were like, this is a, do, uh, uh, a make or break for the country. And people thought we were going to disagree on the system of governance. People thought we were going to disagree on devolution. People thought we were going to disagree on all these issues from chapter one to about uh, even chapter six to seven. Mm. Guess where we disagreed when we hit the agenda rule? We pass the most difficult ones. Every day we'd go to the media and we say, the past system of governance passed. They're like, really? It was amazing until we got to gender issues. So, then we okay. had a stalemate. Yeah, and, and so yes, the court may be brave enough on, other matters, on anything. But they may be brave to enough to make a ruling about God, mm. but they will not be brave enough to make a ruling on, on gender issues. And what does that say? Why, why do you think that is? Uh, have we refused as a society to recognize the role of women? It's our socialization. Mm -hmm. It's our socialization that always puts a lower premium mm -hmm. on women. And uh, sometimes even without noticing, because it's so ingrained in our system. Uh, I was just uh, teaching um, uh, my project management committees as, uh, during the weekend right. about this and I gave, we gave them a very interesting uh, story uh, where a, a person dies and, and, and uh, this, this young man was traveling with the mother dies and uh, not with the mother, was traveling with the father so mm -hmm. he dies mm. and uh, he's rushed to the hospital. The father is a doctor. So we say at the operating th table people asked uh, uh, the, the guy, you know, the doctor comes in and says, oh my God, this is my son. So we ask, how, how possible is that? Hmm. Yet the father uh, died. So guys are saying, oh, it was a miracle. <laughs> oh, you know, it's a miraculous birth. <laughs> Nobody thinks the doctor right. is the mother. Wow. It is that ingrained in That's our system. That's quite right. They do not realize that, hmm. yes, the doctor died. But the doctor, the doctor. who's come to say, Oh my God, this is my son. It's a woman. It's a woman. Because okay. it's so ingrained in us. That it must be a man. You should, have seen, you should have seen the responses. I think my eyes popped a little bit when you said you it know. as well. But um, just to get a, a conclusive answer on this. So um, whereas pa uh, you're saying the judiciary may be... Um, I don't think they're ...will not enough. be brave enough to do it. But do you support the position of uh, you know, civil society and others who have come out to say parliament is unconstitutional and as such should be dissolved. Yes, I do support. You do, okay. Yes. Let's move on to electoral reform. Uh, quickly, currently three bills, I believe, in parliament, all seeming to be providing a mechanism um, for appointing of new commissioners to the IEBC, proposing to trim their numbers as well as reducing the numbers of commissioners required for a quorum. Uh, do you support any of these uh, bills, that of Cheptumo, I think the other is of Kioni and Judunjomo, any of them stand out to you as the solution to electoral issues in I don't IBC? Think, I don't think uh, who we appoint or trimming their numbers and all that is actually a solution. I think we need an engagement at a different level mm -hmm. because it's not just about you know, whether we are appointing three or whether we are appointing four or the system that we are using. I think we, have, we need to have a more honest conversation. 
that starts with the system of governance and that and, and reduces mm -hmm. uh, that high level of competition. So for me, it's not about the commissioners and all that. If we still have that high level of, of competition mm -hmm. uh, for positions, mm -hmm. uh, then the stakes will be higher. You will bring in uh, three people who will be corrupted. Mm -hmm. You bring in 100 people who will be corrupted. You bring in one who will be corrupted. So either way, I don't think it's about numbers. And yet you said for Kibra, you believe that it will be a litmus test for IBC. Yes. And that is what I'm telling you, mm -hmm. that it's a litmus test for IBC because all eyes are on IBC mm -hmm. because of the suspicion that has surrounded the IBC. And the same suspicion is what is evident in what I'm talking to you right now. Okay. Yes. And if you believe then it's about uh, the, the high stakes nature, uh, do yes. or die kind of nature of our politics, how do you fix that? What's that honest System. conversation? An honest conversation that talks about inclusivity, mm -hmm. that talks about you know transparency, that talks about uh, respect for the law, that talks about respect for systems. Inclusivity, you believe, would reduce this substantial level of competition. Sub substantially, yes. And in what way would you entrench that inclusivity? Is it system uh, of governance? what you talked about earlier. Yes. All right. Um, having said that, um, IEBC does run the polls, and you, your party has previously taken issue to how IEBC conducted itself, um, I think, pretty much in, in every um, presidential election you know, we, we've had. We've kept changing IEBC. Um, do you believe that we need a significant and independent audit of how IEBC does its work? I don't think that will help us, I've told you, because we've done this, you know, unfortunately, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask a question because I've been here for the 10th uh, parliament, mm -hmm. 11th parliament, and now 12th parliament, and uh, mm -hmm. the same, same, same issues keep belaboring, you know, IBC, uh, the same, same issues, the same problems about you know, alleged compromise of IBC, alleged interference by IBC. Mm -hmm. Uh, a whole lot of issues that, you know, keep going around uh, IBC. Mm -hmm. So for me, is it just about the fact that we, we want to look at this? I wish there was a way that we could infuse integrity in people because that actually would be our solution. But you can't. Unfortunately not. Um, so is it, uh, mm -hmm. am I saying it's... Um, is it a lost cause? No, I don't think so. I think we must keep our hope open. Let's keep trying. Mm -hmm. Let's keep working hard on instances where we find there are, uh, you know, malpractices. Let us arrest. Mm -hmm. Let us charge. Let mm -hmm. us prosecute. Mm -hmm. Then it will actually act as a deterrence. And finally, your punchline. <laughs> and my punchline <laughs> is really, I support the handshake. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think people should not uh, fear. Sometimes, you know, we've been used to so much negative news mm -hmm. that even when good news comes, we still think it's negative news. So handshake is about, in, you know, uh, harmony. It's about uh, good working relations. Yeah, it's about me and you talking without looking behind, like, what does she mean? What does she want? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You won't see you with the deputy president. Yeah, though I didn't know him personally, but we were same timeline. Uh -huh. We were in different uh, uh, campuses, uh -huh. but same year, uh, same time. Yes. What I do you think of Christian him? Union. Is he an individual that you would say is fit to lead in 2022? Um, Despite the fact that you have, of course, your political allegiances. I would say that uh, he needs to work on certain issues. Like, um, he holds grudges. He he holds, um, as a person who is a political leader, you should not target ethnic communities, and he does. He seems to have a personal vendetta with the Luo community. I have no clue why. Why would you say that? Because of his pronouncement severally. He seems to have a personal vendetta against Luo community. Ah, what wa kungoa mareli. How, you know, uh, Was in he referring Kenya, to the, the Luo community specifically? You know, I don't or, live in, I don't live in, ODM supporters I can generally. tell you that I don't live in mass. Mm -hmm. 
uh -huh. and in this country there are certain words that if you say mm -hmm. because of the way we stereotype each other mm -hmm. then we know if you make a joke about people who are running mm -hmm. then I know you are referring to to challenges mm -hmm. whether rightfully or wrongfully mm -hmm. but we know that usually when people talk about how what wakungu are really whether rightfully or wrongfully people tend to refer to the laws mm -hmm. so I would want to say that he's um he doesn't endear himself to me because he looks like... Uh, he has a problem with your community? Not just that. I like a leader who doesn't look like he has ethnic biases. It doesn't just have to be in my mm. community. Mm -hmm. I don't like people who have ethnic biases. You said so he, he needs to work on that. You said he holds grudges. Why did you say that? Grudges with whom, for instance? Uh, different people. Different people. I have worked with him, remember? Mm -hmm. I was in the same committee with him, even with the president. Correct. So I've worked with them very closely. Does he have a grudge with you? I don't know. I don't know why. He, I've not done anything to him. To, 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 but he may know if he has a grudge with me. I don't know what for. With whom do you think he holds grudges? Uh, with political leadership. You know, when you are in politics, mm. you don't... Um, I always say in politics, there is no rear view mirror. Mm. Uh, in the last election, for instance, uh, I didn't say very pleasant things about the president, Uru Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. Now I say pleasant things about him. That's <laughs> how the nature of politics, mm -hmm. you know, it's cyclic and you don't hold grandes and you don't, you know, there's no rear view mirror. You can't be looking back, what did they do, what did they, you know, kind of thing. Mm. But it seems to have rear view mirror in politics. Should he have a, a handshake of his own with uh, Raila Odinga? Do you think That's, your party leader would welcome that? Our party leader has no issues with people. I think that is one of the hallmarks. He may have his weaknesses, which I'm not discussing here, mm -hmm. but his hallmark that everybody knows about Honorable Raila Molo Odinga is that uh, he doesn't hold grudges. <laughs> Honorable Mili Mabona Othiambo, such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Pleasure. For coming on the program. Thank That's you. That's been Punchline for you. Tonight, another episode next week. Of course, look out for us on our social media platforms and uh, a re-airing of this program tomorrow morning right here on K24. Thanks for watching. Good night. God bless.